Hi, welcome to Math with Marty. Last week we started a topic about the size of infinities and how uh, the natural numbers consist of an infinite set and yet there's a sense where we figure it that the set of all numbers forms a larger infinite set than the set of natural numbers. Um, despite the fact that we paradoxically consider the rational numbers, which is a very dense set which appears to include the natural numbers and many billions more numbers besides it, we consider it to be no more numerous than the natural numbers in the way we count infinities. I'm sure you're wondering why I got onto this topic. Um, Usually the topics I like to do on this show have some sort of personal personal meaning for me, although occasionally I find myself uh, overwhelmed by the, the, the educated public's lack of uh, acquaintance with familiar mathematical facts. You know, and I'm not talking about just ordinary people, I'm talking about the people I see at university uh, graduate students in uh, engineering and physics who aren't uh, familiar with such uh, well-known mathematical proofs such as for example that the square root of 2 is an irrational number or how you prove that the prime numbers constitute an infinite set I mean I used to think that everyone everyone knew this stuff and then I did the show and I started finding out that you know, I'd talk to guys and say, well, I would do something like, you know, that the square root of two is irrational, except everyone knows that. And the guy would say, well, how, how did they prove that? And uh, so sometimes I find myself doing these topics uh, just sort of to fill in the, the gaps left behind by the, the, uh, the sick educational system, uh, which uh, is, uh, suffers from the spiritual sickness of believing that all of its problems are due to lack of money, whereas actually there is billions of dollars in the educational system, and the sickness of the educational system is a sickness of, of knowing, recognizing what's worthwhile. I mean, we're all caught up these days in, in the university with trying to publish papers and prove things that no one's ever proved before and generate generate new results and this this attitude permeates the whole math science engineering uh, the whole and I'm sure it's the same in arts I don't know about how it is in arts but it really permeates the uh, the technical side of universities scientific mathematical side of things and in this rush to create new things we have found that the efficient way to do it is to ignore the great works of the past and get the student as quickly as possible once he's got his undergraduate courses out of the way get him as quickly as possible to specialize in a modern up-to-date state-of-the-art frontier kind of research project which uh, which means that the guy is measuring the specific gravity of mud to decimal places undreamed of only 20 years ago, and yet the same guy does not know how Pythagoras proved 2,000 years ago that the square root of 2 is irrational. And then they say, well, the people in science uh, courses, they don't have any culture. They should be forced to take an English course or a philosophy course or something. Well, this is fine, but I mean, really, what they don't recognize is they don't know their own culture, the culture of science. They don't know the story of James Watt discovering the steam engine. They, they don't know the story of uh, Fermat's last theorem. They just don't know any of these popular uh, mathematical lore things. Now, the story of uh, transfinite numbers, which I'm getting into today, uh, fits into what I call one of the great philosophical accomplishments of mathematics that should sort of be common knowledge to anyone that's ever taken a science course but but seems to somehow slip through the cracks in our rush to to get these people trained for important uh, jobs in the civil service um, what was I talking about just now Neil <laughs> transfinite numbers yeah transfinite numbers yeah now and the reason uh, I got into this subject uh, is associated with one other of the great classical proofs of mathematics of the 19th century, which is 
the proof that the fifth degree equation is unsolvable. And I studied this a long time because, because it's one of those proofs that in their headlong rush to get you up to the forefront of learning in mathematics, the professors say, well, don't worry about all that old stuff. You can look it up in any third year algebra textbook. And I say, yes, but I, I took the third year algebra course and I didn't understand the proof that the fifth degree equation is unsolvable. And they said, well, you're wasting your time trying to understand it because this kind of thing you, you never do understand. All you do is you read the proof line by line and you verify that line 32 follows line 31 and that line 33 follows line 32 according to the standard mathematical rules of logic. There is no overall understanding of this kind of proof. It's merely a matter of verifying the steps one by one. They want you to get that out of the way as quickly as possible so you can get on to these real important things that they're doing nowadays and publishing research on all the time. But I always wondered if it was really true that, that this puzzle, which was, which was worked on by the greatest mathematicians of all time, by, by Newton, by Lagrange, by Gauss. Notice these guys were scientists as well as mathematicians. These were great men, giants of the past. And I wondered if they just figured it out by plowing through proof line by line, by manipulating formal logical statements by rules of logic, or whether they had some total deep understanding of what it means to say that the fifth degree equation is unsolvable. And what I learned in the course of my, my personal study into this is that there is a way of understanding this fantastic theorem, and that it is intimately tied up with the very nature of what are numbers. What are numbers? And how do we name the numbers? How do we recognize them? And a part of this question uh, is associated with the orders of infinity, which was a topic I started last week. And um, I would really like to uh, list the hierarchies of numbers as I, I think I understand them and show you how, they, how I think they go. We'll go over to the big board here. We start with uh, our integers. Integers like 1, 2, 3, etc. And a larger set, which includes the integers, is the set of all rational numbers. 1 and 3 quarters, 7 eighths, 211 over 522. Etc. These are the rational numbers. I'll use a different color of chalk now. We'll say these are rational. Now, outside the rational numbers, we have the big set of all irrational numbers, which we'll call irrational numbers. which are numbers that cannot be expressed in the form of a fraction. And the fact that there's numbers that you can't name by labeling them as a fraction is an amazing fact which was known by the Greeks. Known by the Greeks. Pythagoras showed that the square root of 2 is not rational. So we put the square root of 2 outside here. But we draw a tighter circle around numbers like the square root of 2. And I'll also include in, in this group numbers which I'll call, let's say, the square root of 3 plus 5, and then I'll take the square root of that whole thing. And I'll include here all numbers which you can sort of write down by multiple use of the square root sign. And I will call these numbers constructible numbers. And the numbers within the constructible circle form all the numbers which can be constructed by straight edge and compass uh, under the old classical definitions of the Greeks when they would give the problem, can you construct with straight edge and compass such and such a construction? And I think it was Gauss that really recognized that the constructible numbers included anything that could be written with multiple use of the square root sign, and in doing so showed such things as the polygon of 17 sides is a constructible geometrical figure because the length of the side of that polygon can be expressed all with square root signs. Whereas, if you need something like a cube root sign, cube root of 2, it's not a constructible number because, 
because you can't, with straight edge and compass, come up with the cube root of something. And this uh, recognition settled for all time the ancient question, can you, using straight edge and compass, duplicate a cube? This was the problem of constructing a cube by straight edge and compass, which was twice as big as a, your original cube. Would involve construction of the number cube root of two, and this is shown to be uh, not possible. The numbers of this kind form part of a larger circle, which I'll call the algebraic numbers. And I have a boundary within the algebraic numbers, which includes numbers like the cube root of 2, and in fact includes any numbers that you can sort of write by the cube root of this plus the fifth root of that divided by a lot of other things, or the twelfth root of all this kind of stuff. Using anything with fifth roots or seventh roots and just mixing them all up any which way, you still cannot write every possible algebraic number like that. Because it was finally understood by Lagrange, Gauss, Ruffini, Abel, and Galois around the year 1800 that there are algebraic equations whose solutions are algebraic numbers, yet they cannot be expressed in any form. You just can't write them down. You somehow just can't write them. You can't, no matter the cube root of this and the twelfth root of that, you just can't write them down. Almost unbelievable. These are the numbers which are the solutions of equations of the kind x to the fifth plus 3x plus 5 equals 0. And I can't write the numbers because all you can say about this kind of a number is it's an algebraic number which is the solution of these fifth degree or higher order equations. And yet all the time, with everything in this circle, all the different numbers we've included within these boundaries, we still have not included all irrational numbers. And the way we count orders of infinity this is almost unbelievable. All up to this point, we have still have no more numbers than we started out with 1, 2, 3. All these set of algebraic numbers form a countable set of infinite numbers. You can lay them out in a row and list them one after another. Systematically, there's a way of doing it. And yet, the set of all irrational numbers, numbers which fit on a line, is of a much higher order of infinity so high that you can't even count them. But the paradox is the existence of these numbers, which are irrational, but which do not correspond to any particular algebraic equation, even the existence of these numbers was not proved until 1840-something, when Liouville demonstrated that the number 0.0 point one zero um one zero 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 one zero 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 one where the number of zeros goes as let's make it two six twenty four hundred and twenty in other words the factorial numbers he constructed this number by adding a lot of zeros between every successive one and managed to prove that a number of this kind cannot possibly be the solution of any algebraic equation. And the reason that works is just a fantastic thing. And I almost understand why this is true. And much later, within the 1800s, before the beginning of the 20th century, it was proven that the familiar numbers, familiar to mathematicians, pi and e, the base of the natural logarithms, also belong to this family of non-algebraic irrational numbers. And that these numbers of this kind, which you can hardly even name, are far more numerous than all the other numbers put together. Fantastic thing. And if we have a little more time, we're going to talk about this later in the show. But by now, we should do a song. We always do songs on Mass with Marty. And uh, I believe in music. One thing about this mathematics that we're talking about all these fantastic things were discovered before the dawn of the 20th century. Sometimes I wonder if there was any good math done in the 20th century. But that's something I'm going to talk about on a future show. Something weird happened to the world of math in the 20th century. We got all concerned with generating new results in some tiny specialty of stuff that's so boring no one could possibly be interested in. It. 
but we're just doing it because it's new that no one else has done it. No one wants to waste their time understanding the great achievements of the ancient masters of a hundred years ago. And in music, a peculiar thing also happened, especially in the world of classical music, is until the dawn of the 20th century, the ideal of music was to create something beautiful. But around the start of the 20th century, certain intellectual academic musicians began to say, well, you know, we've sort of done everything that can possibly done, be done in terms of making beautiful music. It's getting boring just making beautiful stuff. Let's make ugly stuff instead. So they made idiotic rules of composition where you're supposed to just do sounds that were ugly, that had idiotic rhythms, and this is what's called classical music now. You listen to, like, CBC FM, and you hear examples of this stuff sometimes. And uh, it's something unprecedented in, in human history that the pursuit of ugliness should, should uh, displace, I mean, the fantastic ability to create beautiful music, which was a, a hard-fought achievement, the ability to create wonderful music was not always intrinsically present within the human race. I mean, we have always had the ability to appreciate music. Somehow it's, it's been born within us. But the knowledge of how to create that kind of music, to, to build the instruments to the rules of harmony, somehow remains to be discovered over the course of ages. This is almost unbelievable. And yet in the 20th century, we have uh, the academic elite is dominated by people who reject the idea that these discoveries are worthwhile. They believe that man can create rules of tonality and composition more interesting than the rules which God has placed within our soul from birth that everyone recognizes when music is beautiful and we recognize that when music is idiotic or ugly. Yet, yet we have this kind of sickness in our present day, I mean, it's the same thing in the world of art, where they can pay a million and a half dollars for the god, for the gosh darn voice of fire to hang in the, in the art gallery and see this is art. I mean, it used to be that you'd paint a beautiful painting and you'd say, well, it's beautiful, and now they have, oh no, that's you're just too too dumb to appreciate what's beautiful. If you really understood things, you would understand this, uh, this uh, that these uh, lines and shapes really are are meaningful, and it's only because you're too ignorant to understand it. I mean, our whole 20th century cult culture has had this undercurrent of intellectual people trying to prove that they can invent aesthetics which are more perfect than the aesthetics which everyone is born with, which are good enough to tell you what's beautiful. I believe in music. I believe in country music. Let's do a beautiful song that was done by a Canadian singer, Mark Midler. He's a guy with that real gravelly voice. He had this radio hit a few years ago, or well, a few months ago. I'm not going to try and do that gravel in his voice. I'm just going to sing it the way I would normally sing. Sleeping with you in my dreams again. Sleeping with you last night In my dream we lay in love Till the morning light Kisses sweet as honey Rub skin on smooth Pillow talking sweet thing to you I'm sleeping with you In my dream
I tried to tell you, but I haven't yet. I'm sleeping with you in my dream. I like that song. I like that song. And there they are. We have them on the board, the hierarchies of numbers. They fit into ever-expanding shells. And almost all the numbers that you can ever think of how to describe them. I mean, we started with the integers that everyone knows. We went to the rational numbers, which are ratios of integers. And we find we still hadn't described all numbers, because the square root of 2 is not a rational number. So we found the square root of 2, and we found many other numbers like it, which you could construct with straight edge and compass, which consisted of all numbers which can be written with multiple use of the square root sign. And yet that wasn't all numbers yet, because the cube root of 2 cannot be expressed as a combination of square roots of anything. So this gives us a wider yet class of numbers, anything that you can write with the cube root of this and the seventh root of that and divide them all together. And this does not yet include all numbers because we find that there are certain algebraic equations such as x to the fifth plus a bunch of stuff equals zero. Algebraic equations whose solution cannot somehow be written with any combination of the square root of this and the cube root of that. You just can't write these kind of numbers and yet they are what we call algebraic numbers. And yes, now you got these uh Three examples here in the outer perimeter, the e pi and this funny, uh, funny decimal here, and those are a, like one step down, what you call the algebraic numbers. For example, numbers that are solution to x to the fifth plus so and so. Yeah. Are, you, are those in the same category? They seem to be separated by a big yellow line. Yeah, the big yellow. What's an example of one of those algebraic numbers? Uh, the big yellow line separates the algebraic numbers from, from the, trans the transcendental example. numbers. Okay. Because by the time we've listed all the algebraic numbers, which includes even numbers that you can't even okay. name. How can you make us believe that, look, we've got an equation, x to the fifth plus 3x plus 5 equals 0. Hard to believe that the solution to that isn't going to be the fifth root of something plus the third root of something else. I've studied that question all my life. I can't make you believe in the remaining two minutes of the show that it can't be done. This is the great achievement of Galois and Abel, the culmination of centuries' effort by, by Cardano, Tartaglia, Newton, Lagrange, okay. Gauss, Is there a Rupini. sentence or two to bring it home? Oh Let's my see. God, it's, it's, I could do my whole life talking okay, about this I'm thing. Sorry. This is a fantastic thing. And, and yet, when we count all these numbers, we still don't have everything, because we get these numbers, you can't even name them. They include stuff like e and pi, and this number constructed the first example known a number that must be transcendental, that could not be algebraic, constructed by Liouville in 1840-something. And uh, the incredible thing demonstrated by Cantor at the turn of the century, and this is almost easy to prove, is that these weird numbers, the transcendental numbers, are far more numerous in some sense than all these other numbers put together. I don't know if we'll ever have a chance to talk about this on TV. I'd like to come back to it someday. But the show is just about over. Uncle Marty's not going to give you a problem for next week because I don't have one. Uh, I don't have one lined up. We got about a minute left, and uh, we're just going to run it down with a song. Have we got anything figured out? You want to do that? Uh, living on cupcakes? Yeah. Okay. Living on sponge cake, Jimmy Buffett. This is sort of. Uh, this is kind of song sort of counts as country in 1990. I don't know if they called it country when it came out in the 70s.
with its brand new tattoo.